So these women were literally teaching other women occult secrets through using a primitive form of LSD. Hello my friends of the Psychedelic Renaissance, it's Tom Hatzis, your Psychedelic Historian, and this is the strange and magical history of ergot before LSD. Most of you know that ergot is a fungus that grows on diseased grain, and it was from that fungus that Albert Hoffman first synthesized LSD in 1938. Ergot's history goes so much deeper than that. It has played a role in the magic, witchcraft, medicine, and mystery religions of yore. And in this video, I'm going to try to break that all down. But first, if you're into this kind of content, please give this video a like and a share, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon so that you're notified every time I post a new video. Also, it'd be great to see you on Instagram. Find me at Psychedelic Historian. With that out of the way... Let's get into it. What ergot is most known for in history is not its magical or medicinal uses, but rather as the cause of ergotism, known throughout Europe as the Ignis Sacar, or the Holy Fire, sometimes referred to as St. Anthony's Fire, St. Anthony being the patron saint of ergotism. Symptoms of ergotism include, like, brutal diarrhea, like, not just regular diarrhea, but I mean, like, holy shit, ah! <laughs> Holy shit, <laughs> Ignis Akar, holy shit, holy fire. Anyway, um, brutal diarrhea, um, muscle aches, spasms, hallucinations, vertigo, um, your limbs become gangrenous and fall off, and eventually you die, or at least most people do die from ergotism, although some people have been known to survive it. In fact, we have a description of ergotism survivors from the 12th century Englishman, uh, Hugh of Lincoln, well actually now St. Hugh of Lincoln, and uh, he paints a pretty gruesome scene for us. Although terribly crippled, their health was nonetheless restored. Some lacked a forearm, others a leg, or even a leg and thigh up to the groin. But Ergot's history does not begin end-to-end -end with the holy fire. Despite the dangers of working with Ergot, it actually remained in medical vogue throughout Western history. Since the days of Hippocrates, Physicians would use ergot to speed up contractions uh, during child delivery in the mother. Now, we know that that remained a popular usage for ergot all throughout the European history because it appears in Adam Lanasser's Krauter book, which means herbal in German, from 1557, and Lanasser describes using ergot the same ways that Hippocrates did. Medicinal uses for ergot could also be found in what were called leech books. Leech books were these sort of ad hoc medical books for lower class people. Within these leech books, we find so many uses for ergot, specifically for help with urination problems. But we also find ergot recipes for stomach ache, for scabs, and even, believe it or not, as an ingredient in an acne cream. As for its role in religion, most people today place the beginning of ergot's use as an entheogen with the famous rites of Eleusis in ancient Athens. Now, I'm well aware that that is what is popularly believed and that what I'm about to say is going to cut against that, but believe it or not, there is surprisingly zero evidence to suggest that ergot played any role in the rites of Eleusis at all. The only two books to ever tackle that question in a deep and profound way was first The Road to Eleusis by Albert Hoffman, Robert Gordon Wasson, and Carl Ruck, and then later, just a few years ago, with Brian Murarescu's The Immortality Key. The Road to Eleusis is the reason most people believe that ergot was used during the ceremonies, but a careful reading of the book doesn't turn up anything concrete, or even not so concrete, to suggest that the ancient Greeks were using ergot during the rites. The closest the authors get to showing any evidence, and here I'm using that word evidence very loosely, is when they state, correctly I might add, that the Rarian fields, which is where the ancient Athenians grew their, their wheat, was just across the way from the Telesterion, which is where they held the mystery ceremonies. With much love to Ruck, Wasson, and Hoffman for their contributions to other areas of psychedelic history and culture, that is very much a correlation equals causation fallacy. Having a wheat field in close proximity to a temple is not evidence that the wheat was used to produce ergot for use in the temple. I mean, there's just too many leaps there. Nonetheless, that idea was picked up by Brian Murarescu in The Immortality Key. And just want to say, as much as I really liked The Immortality Key, and as much as I really like Brian as a person, he also does not offer really 
any evidence whatsoever to suggest that ergot was used at Eleusis. Now, I don't want to spend the entirety of this video talking about the shortcomings of the ergot at Eleusis hypothesis, so we're going to put a pin in it for now and just know that I'll be making a full video on that topic in the future. Now, where Murarescu and I do agree has to do with an analog rite to those of Eleusis found in Catalonia, Spain. There, an archaeologist named Juan Jordi Treseras uncovered uh, the skeletal remains uh, that of, of a skull that included teeth and also a chalice, and both the teeth and the chalice had some residue on them. And that residue was scraped and tested in labs, and it turned out that it, was, it tested positive for ergot. So both the chalice and the teeth had ergot on them, okay? That is the kind of solid evidence I'd like to see for ergot at Eleusis. So while Brian and I absolutely agree that ergot was used in this uh, analog mystery rite in Catalonia, we disagree that there's any evidence to suggest that the Greeks were using ergot as well. Ergot was also used in witchcraft. At least some evidence from Finnmark, Norway would suggest that. The district governor of Finnmark, a guy named Hans Hansen Lillenskold, wanted to record all of the cases of witchcraft that took place in his district between 1620 and 1684 when he was compiling these documents. The first case to involve ergot probably took place in 1625 when a woman named Ganel Olsdatter ate a piece of bread given to her by the daughter of another woman named Screpan. Now, while Olsdowder ate the loaf, Screpan called out, Now the devil got into you. Shortly thereafter, Ganel felt abdominal pain, as if something living had entered her. She later had a vision of Satan who appeared to her in the form of a black dog. Another woman, Sigri of Steinland, gave this kind of bread to at least two other women. One became so disturbed that she could not help thinking she was in hell. As for the other, eating the bread made the earth run around with her, meaning it caused vertigo, and at once the devil came to them. Now here's the interesting part. Several records indicate that those who learned witchcraft did so after drinking either milk or a beer and finding something black the size of barley grains in the bottoms of their cups and bowls. So these women were literally teaching other women occult secrets through using a primitive form of LSD. I thought that was pretty cool. Now one place where ergot does not appear in witchcraft history, uh, despite popular belief to the contrary, has to do with the Salem witch trials. Now I've done a whole video on the Salem witch trials, so I'm not going to get into it here, but I'll link that video at the end. Instead, I'd like to end this video on a scene that involved ergot that ended up having a lasting effect on popular culture. Sometime around the end of summer 1885, Robert Louis Stevens was thrashing around in his bed in agony, so much so that he woke up his wife Fanny who was sleeping beside him. Robert suffered from tuberculosis and his doctor had prescribed to him ergotine, which is an ergot-based medication, to suppress the bleeding in his lungs. Scared for her husband, Fanny penned a letter to Robert's literary agent and friend, a guy named Mr. William Henley. The letter outlines Robert's tormented bouts with muscle spasms and visions. Fanny also describes his mad behavior and concludes, I think it must be the ergotine that affects his brain at such time. One night, during Robert's psychic bouts with ergotine, he once again was thrashing around so much that he woke his wife up, who in turn decided to stir him from his sleep. He woke up and told Fanny that he had been dreaming a most novel nightmare, one about a doctor who invents a potion that would suppress his shadow side. However, instead of calming his baser instincts, the potion transforms the doctor into the physical embodiment of his shadow side, a sinister gentleman known as Mr. Edward Hyde. Robert would eventually write a novel based on that dream, which he titled, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which became an instant bestseller in his own time. The term Jekyll and Hyde is still used today to describe people who can be calm one moment and then fly off the handle the next. But it was only in the 20th century that ergot would achieve its highest level of fame as the base element for LSD. In that form, ergot would go on to change minds and cultures forever, I mean far more than Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And the rest, as they say, 
is psychedelic history. Well, my friends, that's all I have for you this time, and I'd love to thank you for stopping by. Please give this video a like and a share, and subscribe to the channel if you found value in the content, and please find me on Instagram. And until we meet again, I'm Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, reminding you that you free your mind by using your brain. Peace!